from more than seven disciplines, practicing businessmen, economists, journalists, as well as specialized experts from different fields. Understanding the fundamentals of the economy can provide answers about the knowledge and skills necessary not only for surviving in the market in unpredictable conditions, but for achieving the well-being of many, a process which is not spontaneous, but mastered. I am sincerely honored and pleased to welcome everyone to the second online panel of the International Conference arranged by the European Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And today we are glad to welcome the reunion of experts in the framework of real life and real economics conference discussion. So, the key discussion points of the current online panel are the first one, origins of business consultants and the security field, and the second one, business heroes of different times. And I'm Irina Lopatyuk. I'm happy to be your moderator today. And now, please let me introduce our speakers right in the way they are given the floor. Professor Elizabeth Harsh Edesheim is an adjunct professor at New York University. Dr. Edesheim is a themes creator, has studied, written about, and advised organizations for over 30 years. A former partner with McKinsey & Company, she currently works with senior executives and their enterprises growth exceeds their capacities and with clients ranging from young firms and the largest global nonprofits to Fortune 100 companies. Elizabeth is the author of McKinsey's Marvin Bauer and the Definitive Drucker, Challenges for Tomorrow's Executives, Final Advice from the Father of Modern Management. We are pleased to have you today. Our next speaker would be Dr. Alek Maltsev. Author, criminologist, psychologist, lawyer, investigative journalist, business strategy consultant. He is an academician of European Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, founder and director of the Memory Institute, head of Expeditionary Corps. He is an author of numerous books in the areas such as applied history, sociology, depth psychology, philosophy, criminalistics, and criminology. Dr. Maltsev has been conducting field research with the Expeditionary Corps in many countries for more than six years to explore the way different nations and rulers attained power throughout the history. He is an editor of several interdisciplinary peer-reviewed journals. Welcome, Dr. Maltsev. Our next speaker would be Professor James Finkenauer, organized crime expert, author, distinguished professor emeritus at Rutgers University, former director of the National Institute of Justice, Washington, D.C., Academician of European Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Dr. Finkenauer is an expert in human trafficking, juvenile, and international criminal justice. Author of numerous books on Russian organized crime in the US. Welcome. And our next speaker would be Eduardo Almeida. He is the CEO of Indra and State Brazil. He manages more than 8,500 specialists and has more than 25 years of professional experience in companies such as Alcatel, Cisco Systems, and Unisys. Previously, he served as vice president and general manager for Unisys Corporation in Latin America. Almeida holds a computer science degree from University of McKenzie and specialization in marketing and business strategy from FIA. At the moment, he is doing his PhD in artificial intelligence. So welcome, dear speakers. Let me please deliver just a few words about the reference terms of this panel. Each speaker has the opportunity to answer two questions in two rounds, and please limit the extent of your speeches up to eight to 10 minutes. So to begin with, we shall start the discussion on the very first issue, origins of business consultants and the security field. And to begin with, I would like to give the floor to Professor Elizabeth Haas Edersheim. So please, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm much more familiar with consulting than security. So I'm going to kind of focus my eight minutes uh, on that part of uh, the question. And uh, let me first define kind of what I think of as a consultant. And it's outside management without any authority. So you have to be successful, you have to ha have trust and and be, be brought in in, in a in a different kind of way. Um, and consultant is more than just giving advice. It's being a change agent, it's coaching, it's being a thinking partner, it's problem solving, it's managing projects, and it's supplementing headcount. If we go back in time and begin to think about how management consulting happened, et cetera, uh, I like to go back to a reference Peter Drucker often used in 1850, minus the India Trading Company, the largest company in the world had 300 people. And management was really unknown. 
In 1886, the first firm in the world used management consulting in their name, Arthur D. Little. It was a spinoff from MIT and it was really a, a time management and a specialist in engineering. In about 1914, so 1850, there's nothing big. 1890, there's specialists coming in. 1914, Booz from the Kellogg School in Chicago and Allen started an advisory firm. And James McKinsey, who was at the University of Chicago, began McKinsey in 1926. And it was about accounting, bookkeeping. Again, specialists. Armour Meat was the biggest client of McKinsey in 1923. They wanted budgetary controls so they could manage the numbers. Um, I, I might argue that um, Marvin Bauer and, and Peter Drucker, the two, the two people I've written about, really defined what I think of as management consulting today. Um, and let me just spend a moment. Marvin Bauer was a lawyer, uh, and he was a lawyer in Cleveland at, during the Great Depression. But he was the only one in his firm that also had an MBA. So he was on the um, advisory committee to all the bankrupt companies uh, in the Great Depression. And he came out of that, that and he said, the guys at TRW or any of these companies, the presidents aren't dumb. It didn't happen because they were dumb. The Great Depression happened because knowledge inside the firm did not go to the CEO. People didn't, the, Marvin would go talk to the CEO and, or president and couldn't find an answer. Then he'd go talk to the vice president. Then he'd go out in the field and he would find the answer. The people in the field working with customers knew what was happening, but they didn't tell the CEO. Hence, he believed there was a real need for an outsider to come in and begin to um, help break hierarchies. Comparably, Peter Drucker saw what the Great Depression did to Europe. When there wasn't an economy that was working, um, he believed that's what gave rise uh, to, to the Nazis, because when stuff isn't working, you just reach for anything you can reach for. And the, econo the economy has to work for society to work. People have to feel good about what they're doing. With that drive, he went in and said, we have to really understand the behavior inside organizations. And there was not much written about it. So he viewed his job as asking questions so people could think. Um, you know, the next big firm that really happened was Bruce Henderson. Uh, who started um, Boston Consulting Group uh, in the mid-60s. And he really saw a need for strategy and thinking differently. Um, and while this was going on, both Booz Allen and McKinsey uh, began to bring in not experts, but people that could ask good questions, people that were smart and could, could help somebody think. Um, you know, and, and, and the industry's evolved a lot. Uh, I, I would even argue that kind of my fate, one of my favorite consultants is Roger Martin, who uh, was the dean in the, in the Toronto School, worked with um, Procter & Gamble, uh, worked with Best Buy or, um, as they began to change. And he really believed the role of a consultant was to be a thought partner for CEOs, just like the people with customers don't tell the CEOs everything, it's hard for a CEO to think out loud because anything they say, people take literally and go do. And by having a thought partner that they can think with, that is a great facilitator. And again, going back to my definition, consultants are outside management. They're trusted to help make organizations better organizations. Uh, and how that, the need for that and what's needed today is different than it was five years ago or 10 years ago, but there still is a need for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech. And right away, please let me give the floor to our next speaker, Dr. Oleg Maltsev. Please, you're welcome.
Здравствуйте, уважаемые дамы и господа. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Я вчера уже говорил о том, что я поставил себе задачу каждой конференции писать книгу. Yes, on yesterday's panel I have mentioned that I set myself a task to author uh, one book for each conference. И к этой конференции я тоже написал книгу, она выглядит вот таким вот способом. And for this conference I also prepared a book and here's the cover of it где ну, описано достаточно длинное исследование экономики глазами как бы консультанта. Consultant. Да, и я ее так и назвал «Тайна или преступление». And I titled the book as Enigma or Crime. Да, то есть по сути своей, как бы, когда мы отвечаем на Первый вопрос о происхождении бизнес-консалтинга и отрасли безопасности – это очень давняя как бы, история. And while we are attempting to answer the first question of the panel, the origin of uh, uh, business consultants and security field, this is a very uh, long uh, time topic. I mean, it's very old. Я в отличие от коллег как бы бизнес-консалтинг пришел как бы из отрасли консультирования безопасности. And in contrast to my colleagues, I came to the sphere of um, business consulting from security field. Да, и в общем-то я эти отрасли для себя уже впоследствии перестал различать. And after a while, I stopped really differentiating these two things. Потому что все проблемы в компании начинаются задолго до вопросов безопасности. And uh, the reason is because all of the problems in the company, they start prior, uh, to, uh, prior they have problems in security field. И я когда-то даже на конференции говорил, что если вы вовремя не приглашаете консультантов, то потом вы приглашаете, будете вынуждены приглашать других консультантов уже в области безопасности. At one point, uh, in one of the conferences, I mentioned if the managers of the companies do not invite proper consultants and, and at time, on time, they will have to uh, invite security consultants inevitably. Because they will have no choice but to invite other types of consultants. Да, а, по сути своей, если вы этого не сделаете, то вам не за что будет приглашать каких-либо консультантов больше. And even if that second step is not implemented, then there will be no reason to work with consultants anymore. Да, поэтому как бы в общем-то стадии краха, как бы они, в общем-то, всем в мире известны. Main stages of the crash are all known to everybody. Да, но при этом почему-то большинство руководителей на это никакого внимания не обращают. Nevertheless, uh, a lot of managers, uh, heads of the companies in today's world do not pay attention to those stages. Да, и в общем-то я согласен с коллегой, как бы в том, что если консультанты, как она выразилась, как бы друзья, да, то настоящие друзья, они человеку в лицо все говорят, как есть, как бы, да. And I do agree with my colleague, Professor Elizabeth, uh, which gave the definition of uh, who are consultants, who are like thought partners uh, of the client, like friends. And if uh, this is the case, then we do know that such people should tell the truth to your face. Да, но и когда говорят о том, что консультанты должны задавать вопросы, возможно, в Соединенных Штатах Америки это работает. And when it's about consultant asking proper questions, maybe it does work in the U.S. То есть, если это касается русскоязычного пространства. In contrast to this, in Russian-speaking environment. Вам могут сказать, что вас сюда пригласили не для того, чтобы вы задавали вопросы, а для того, чтобы мы вам задавали вопросы. You might be uh, told that a consultant, you are invited here not so that you ask us questions, but so we ask you questions. Да, поэтому как бы обычно первый вопрос, когда ты входишь, тебе уже с порога спрашивают, объясните нам, что происходит. Usually the first question that clients ask right after you have entered the 
building, they say, could you please explain what is going on here? И совершенно не важно, знаком ты с проблемой или нет. And they don't care at all if you are acquainted with their problematics or not. И по сути своей, я когда писал книгу, я, в общем-то, не обращал внимания на эту шкалу, но с вами об этой шкале сегодня как раз хотел поговорить, потому что сознание того, кого мы консультируем, находится на одном из этих уровней. And uh, I was not planning to present a specific scale, but uh, I will do it right now because it correlates with the perception and consciousness of people. То есть, по сути своей, это история всей отрасли консультирования за всю известную историю человечества. In other words, this scale is an entire history of consulting in the course of human history. Если вы не против, я пойду снизу вверх. And if you do not mind, I will start from bottom to up. И когда я захожу, меня спрашивают, когда я еще не знаком с делом, объясните нам, что происходит. Это как раз мифологическое, мифологический уровень восприятия консультантов. And so uh, that instance when a consultant enters the client's building and when he is asked, could you please explain what is going on, even if he is not acquainted yet with the problematic, this would correspond to the mythological perception of who consultants are. То есть, по, по сути своей, как бы, э, мы знаем, что у разных народов существует огромное количество сказок, мифов и так далее и тому подобное. И там обязательно какой-то человек находится, который совершенно безвозмездно рассказывает другому человеку, как ему остаться в благополучном состоянии. Every nation on this earth has its own, like, folklore, has its own um, stories and things which are preserved in the tales. And in those tales, we always have those type of characters that are ready to explain uh, what is going on, what will happen just for free, just out of nowhere. То есть, когда человек находится на таком уровне, его очень сложно консультировать без мифологем. And so when a person's perception is on this level, it's quite hard to consult him without using an element of mythologems. Когда мы пойдем с вами выше, на ступень выше уровня сознания, как бы мы будем говорить о том, что этот уровень называется разочарование в науке. When we, we go up to the next level uh, on this scale, on this measuring tool, this level of perception of human beings relates to being disappointed with science. Представляете себе, он же закончил Гарвардский университет. Could you imagine a graduate of Harvard University? Он же великий человек. Somebody who is great. Да, и не знает, что делать в простой ситуации. And at the same time, he understands that he cannot he doesn't know what to do in a very simple situation. Да, тут есть люди, которые присутствуют, которые видели, как на одном из семинаров, которые я проводил, люди хватались за голову и говорили, зачем я заканчивал университет. And on this panel, we have people that uh, saw with their own eyes how on one of the seminars that I have conducted, people were like just uh, holding their heads and telling, why did I graduate uh, from the university in the first place. Да, ну, дело не в университете, а дело в человеке, как вы понимаете. But certainly, uh, the whole question, the whole thing is not about university, but about person himself. Да, и на этом уровне обычно люди э, ищут каких-то великих как бы людей, до которых они не могут дотянуться, ну, никак. And usually on this level of perception, people try to reach uh, great figures, other figures that they look up to, but do not have a direct access. Следующий уровень, номер три, это уровень приверженности, и он самый плохой из всех уровней. Он хотя и стоит на третьем уровне перед этими, ну, над этими двумя, но это то, что обычно является причиной всех проблем человека в жизни. And the uh, third uh, level on this scale uh, is about being adherent uh, to something in quotation marks. Even though this goes third on this level, it's uh, one of the worst perspectives. И дело в том, что когда появились четыре школы, общепринятые в мире, японская, русская, европейская, американская. When four main schools of thoughts, uh, when it comes to consulting, originated in the world, 
Japanese, American, European and Russian school. То люди становились приверженцем одной школы. People choose to become adherent of this or that school. И вместо того, чтобы их все вместе комплексно изучать. Instead of uh, studying every school like as a one general picture. Да, и получилась такая ситуация, что uh, когда они становились приверженными определенной школы, они становились приверженными определенной философии. And so in consequence that led to being uh, a follower, being an adherent of a specific philosophy just because they were follower of the specific school. И эта философия как раз их приводила их к краху. And that philosophy would lead them to uh, a crash. Поэтому приверженность к школе это, конечно, очень хорошо, но как бы она опасна. So adherence to a specific school is a good thing, but it might be dangerous. И особенно опасно на сегодня. And particularly in today's world. Опасно она потому, что очень быстро все меняется. Because the speeds uh, uh, with um, the way events take place are very fast. И четвертый уровень, когда мы поднимаемся на четвертую ступень, мы говорим об, я ее называю открытием отрасли или как бы э, специализации. And the next, the fourth level on the scale is, uh, I termed it conventionally, opening a sphere uh, or specialization. И здесь самая большая проблема человека заключается в том, что он не может выбрать тех консультантов, которые ему нужны. And on this level, uh, Main problem which is faced by a human being is that he cannot make a right choice of a consultant that he really needs. То есть получается он приглашает бизнес консультантов, а задает вопросы как психологу. And the situation is as follows: he invites allegedly a consultant, however, he starts asking questions as to a psychologist. So, и, а многим из них вместо консультант бизнес консультанта нужен психиатр. And most of those clients on this level, they really need a psychiatrist more than they need a consultant. Да, то есть как бы они не отличают адвоката от бизнес-консультанта, от психолога, от психоаналитика. То есть им вообще все равно, лишь бы был консультант. So they don't really differentiate uh, between attorney and a consultant. They don't differentiate between a psychologist or other type of specialist. И самый лучший консультант для таких людей это тот консультант, который им нравится. And for this type of people, the best consultant in the world is the one that they like. Да, и совершенно не важно, что он умеет и что он будет делать, главное, чтобы он нравился тому, кого он консультирует. Да. So uh, they do not prioritize his competency or what he can actually do, but it's all about really liking or disliking a person. Когда мы поднимаемся на пятую ступень, scale, это ступень конфликта в отрасли. То есть, по сути своей, узкая специализация, она в этой отрасли не работает. Narrow, narrow То есть, здесь нужны ну, уровень э, энциклопедических знаний. Because this level requires one to have encyclopedic knowledge on the matter. То есть вы не можете решить проблему, зная какую-то одну отрасль, какие-то какие имея какие-то навыки. It is impossible to solve the issue just by having knowledge in the specific area. I mean, uh, one should be very um, have multifaceted competency. Американцы бы сказали, какая проблема? Соберите проектную группу. And Americans would say here, well, uh, what is the issue? Why don't you just gather uh, people that you need into a group? Вопрос из кого? And here's the question, where we will take those people from? Да, и проектная группа это один бюджет. Because having such a specialized group uh, would take specific budget. А, простите, если в эту проектную группу нужно включить 30 человек. But what if that group has to involve 30 different professionals? Ей еще кто-то должен управлять. And also we should not forget that somebody has to manage that group. 
И, как вы понимаете, у нас же вечный конфликт между консультантами. And as you know, it is an eternal conflict between among consultants. Адвокаты будут говорить одно, бизнес-консультанты будут говорить другое. Because attorneys would say one thing and business consultants would be, would be saying a different thing. И возникает конфликт отраслей. And what happens, we have a conflict of different spheres. И когда мы поднимаемся с вами на шестую ступень, and when we raise to the sixth Uh, level on this tool. Я как бы в общем говорю о том, что эта шестая ступень называется возвращение к фундаментальным научным основам. I title it as returning to basic fundamental scientific truths. То есть по сути своей, как бы для того, чтобы консультировать людей, они должны понимать ценность того, что вы делаете. In the first place, in order to consult people, those clients, they should really comprehend and value and understand what you are doing. И для этого их надо учить. And in order to make that happen, they should be taught. Да, поэтому, например, я как бы я считаю, что консультирование консультированием, а образование бизнесменов это образование, и нужно заниматься и тем и тем одновременно. So I do understand that consulting is a consultant, but the education of a businessman is still a separate topic, and I do believe that both of these things are indispensable. Да, и поэтому вот у меня была такая интересная ситуация несколько месяцев назад. A couple of months ago, I found myself in a peculiar situation. Один бизнесмен в Мюнхене. One businessman in Munich. Говорит мне, дай мне книгу порекомендую, которую прочитать для того, чтобы я ну, стал ну, поумнее в этом вопросе. He asked for a book, uh, telling, could you please recommend me a book so it would raise my qualification? И я ему дал самую простую книгу вообще, элементарную. And I gave him the, a very, very simple book. Он еле прочитал две страницы, говорит, слушай, ты не можешь мне рассказать, что здесь написано? And he barely read two pages, and after that he said, "Hey, listen, could you please explain what is this book about?" Так за полчаса, ну, чтобы времени много не терять, ты перескажи мне просто. And in order to be like fast, in order not to spend time, could you please just summarize the book in half an hour for me? Да, то есть как бы вы же понимаете, когда вы говорите с человеком, он должен понимать ценность того, что вы говорите. So again, when uh, consultants are speaking, uh, communicating to their clients, clients should understand the value of what is being told. I mean, they should really understand the essence of what you're telling them. And when we uh, go, go up to the seventh level on the scale, it is about changing one's philosophy. Если вы посмотрите на подход Леопольда Сонди к психологии судьба анализа, Sondi, analysis, for in, for example, а я являюсь представителем именно этой школы психологии. And when it comes to the psychology, uh, I am the follower of this Leopold Sondi school. И она очень непростая школа. And it's not an easy one. Да, то вы увидите, что все проблемы у человека начинаются с его философии. And uh, the schools, uh, this school of thought, it shows that actually all of the problems of human beings, they stem from their philosophy. И это прямо влияет на его навыки. And this directly um, influences his skills. И прямо, прямо влияет на систему управления предприятием. And it influences the way he manage, manages his enterprise. And when we go up to the last level of the scale, it is titled alternative sphere. Существуют люди, которые лучше нас это делают, просто они этим не занимаются. At this point, it's about an understanding that there are people that are engaged in different activities. However, they can do what we do in a way better manner. 
И в этот момент времени мы начинаем наконец понимать, что мы все, что мы делали до этого, это такое ну, очень, нам очень низком дилетантическом уровне. And at this point, um, a professional does understand that what he was doing before, compared to the uh, people, what uh, what they are doing in an alternative sphere, what he is doing is something like a very small, very insignificant in professionalism. И вот люди, у которых надо учиться. And that the, I mean, these are people in an alternative sphere that one should learn from. И эти люди к бизнесу не имеют никакого отношения. And at the same time, those very professionals, they do not have a relation to the business sphere. То есть эта модель, она одновременно показывает поэтапно стадии формирования отрасли, историю его формирования. So the model that I, that I have briefly described explains the history um, and the way uh, entire industry, entire sphere was formed historically. Одновременно показывает стадии, через которые мы проходим, работая с клиентом. At the same time, it demonstrates us different stages that we go through while working with a client. И одновременно показывает нам, какие трудности нас ждут на пути тому, чтобы нашего клиента можно было перестать консультировать. From the other side, it shows the hardships that we might face um, that might lead to not consulting actually the client. И самое главное, что эта система дает нам совершенно четкие понимания того, что нужно делать, в какой момент времени, в зависимости от той стадии, на которой находится клиент, в тот или иной момент времени, когда вы начинаете его консультировать. And at the same time, uh, this tool shows us what has to be done with the client for a client at the moment of time where he is right now. And thank you very much for attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Matsu, for your speech. And right now, I'm glad to give the floor to our next speaker, Professor James Finkenawa. You're welcome. Please turn on your mic. Okay, you can hear me? Okay, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me once again to participate uh, uh, in what has become a very interesting series of, of discussions around different uh, subjects. Uh, I will say at the outset, I was initially a little reluctant to volunteer to participate with this subject because I'm not an economist. Uh, I have, I'm not a business person. I have not studied business per se and so on. Uh, I'm a criminologist. So I know something about crime and so on, but, but don't claim, as I said, to be, be an economist. So I looked at the range of topics that were going to be discussed over the three or four days of these conferences. And I see that one of them is dealing with security. So I, I thought, aha, there, there, there could be a connection in terms of what, what I know about and what I'm interested in and this notion of security. So that's why I've decided to focus on this uh, particular area. My experience with dealing with uh, consultants in general, in general comes in sort of two respects. One is, first of all, I've done a fair amount of consulting myself. I've been hired as an individual consultant to participate in a variety of activities and on a variety of uh, occasions. Uh, and I've also been in a position, having worked with government and worked at the university, to hire uh, people as consultants. So I've had experience in, in sort of both sides, being a consultant and hiring consultants to perform a variety of activities. Uh, for example, uh, when, when I was working at the Department of Justice, the National Institute of Justice, uh, we, would, we produced a lot of reports and publications. Uh, and rather than, than trying to mount our own inside the government publication enterprise, we decided to what, what's called outsource this activity. So what we did was we put out a contract for a publishing company to take over that part of that, that business. Uh, and, it, it, and it's an example of where a government entity outsources what would otherwise be a government activity to a private sector entity, in this case, a, a publishing operation. Uh, they're, they're both pluses and minuses to this kind of government. And that's gonna be my focus, government outsourcing governmental, what, what would be otherwise governmental activities to private sector agencies. Sometimes these are individual consultants, sometimes they're organizations, 
uh, with, with whom we had contracts. So they're like contract employees or contract companies that are now doing government uh, uh, activities. They're both pluses and minuses to this kind of thing. The pluses have to do, if you take the publishing example, rather than, rather than us having some government employees who might know a little bit about the publishing business, the company that we retained were experts in this. These were people who know how to publish things. They, have, they know how to market. They know how to distribute. They know about mailing. They know all of those things that publishing has to, has to accomplish. So rather than having some sort of mediocre humdrum operation within the government, we outsourced this and, you know, to this private sector and they were able to do this job extremely well. This is the plus side. Why are these people more qualified? Because the private sector pays better salaries than people working for government. They're also much more able to quickly get rid of people if they don't perform well. Whereas in the government, you got civil service protections, you got a lot of you know, uh, things that you have to go through if you, if you got non-performance uh, who are working. So they pay higher pay, and they're, they're usually more up to date on the training and so on. So they're, they're better able to do their jobs. So this is a plus. Uh, on the other hand, on the minus side, these are for-profit entities. So what they're doing is, you know, they're taking on a particular task, but they're hoping to make a profit out of this. So this often means this is not a cost-saving uh, exercise as far as the government is concerned. It may appear to be that way on the surface, but in the long run, proves not to be that way. Uh, for instance, I served under both a Democratic and Republican administration in Washington. It happened to, it happened to spread over the four years of two administrations. And the Republicans came in with the goal of reducing the size of government uh, because you know smaller government, lower taxes, fewer government employees and so on. These are all government Republican mantras about the government. Well, in effect, what happened was they contracted out these government services, which ended up costing more than if they'd been done by government employees. So although on the one hand, it might look like government was cheaper, in fact, government was more expensive in terms of the money that was going to the private contractors. Let me turn particularly to the issue of security. Uh, and, and here we see a very different, as we say, ball of wax than with the issue of, of putting out publications. Because security to me means protection. And then, and which raises the question of protection from what? Protection from whom and from what? And to give you a, a, a local example, again, from my background being a criminologist, a number of prisons uh, in the United States have contracted out prison services to the private sector. Instead of having public, instance, public prisons and public jails and so on, they've contracted with private companies to run these prisons with the idea that this can be done more cheaply, more efficiently, and more effectively. But again, often what's happened is because this is a, there's a profit motive driving these public sector companies, which, which are getting these contracts, they tend to shortchange the delivery of services. And we saw that recently, just in the past year, with what's happened with COVID in jails and prisons, where the healthcare that was being provided was very substandard. Uh, and I've seen situations in jails where the diets that are being provided to inmates in these jails and prisons are extremely, extremely limited. Why is that? So that they can maximize the profit. So whereas government is out of providing, you know, fulfilling the governmental mission, the private sector who are brought in as consultants and contractors, their motive is profit. They, 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 I mean, that's what they're about. They're, they're money-making operations. They're not about service delivery or accomplishing the, the missions of government. This, this is, raises the interesting question that, uh, and, it, and it's caused a big debate about this outsourcing of governmental functions. Are there certain things that the government does that are inherent to the government and ought not to be turned over to the private sector? And do not these things fall in the area, for example, of public safety and, 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 and punishment of offenders, issues of, of maintaining a rule of law and securing justice and so on. These, these are inherent, in my mind, inherent government responsibilities. They're not, this is the society at large and the government that represents the society that ought to be doing this kind of thing, not turning it over to a profit-making uh, uh, enterprise. 
And that's why I have a lot of problems with this notion, for example, of the, of the private uh, jail sector and how that operates. Where it becomes even more problematical when, is when you get to the, the national security level, the security of the country, where you're talking about defense and, uh, and, and so on. This becomes especially problematic. And what we have seen, particularly in this country over the last 25 years, is an outsourcing of intelligence collection responsibilities, military responsibilities, training, and even sending overseas individuals who work for the private sector. They're not, they're not government employees. They're not in the army. They don't work, with, they're not in the State Department. They're not in the Defense Department. In some cases, they're not even in the CIA. They contract employees working on behalf of those organizations. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's, it goes back to the question of, are those sorts of things inherent governmental responsibilities? When a country decides to go to war, and commit troops in a wartime situation. Is that not an inherent governmental responsibility of the whole society, of the whole country? It's not, it, again, it's not like publishing a report and marketing report. You're talking about giving enormous power and authority to the private sector to carry out what would otherwise be governmental uh, responsibilities. And I think as, as Elizabeth said very early on in her presentation, the issues of accountability. When, when, when we send, and, and we can argue about whether these are, these are good ideas or not, but when the US sends troops overseas, there's an accountability of those troops back to the command structure. When we send private sector employees overseas under, under various cover and disguises and so on, where is their accountability? Who, who are they answerable to? And what happens if they act outside the bounds, the rules of war, for example, or, or various and, and sundry other things? And we've seen numerous examples of that. We, we ran jails in Iraq, and we saw what happened with some of those jails. There was a, there's an organization that I'm going to talk about in my discussion of heroes, the guy who set up the organization. There's an organization called Blackwater. Blackwater arose in the late 1990s and early 2000s, training military personnel. Well, what happens with Blackwater? Blackwater employees get sent to Afghanistan. Blackwater employees get sent to Iraq. They take on a, a large number of roles that we, the government, because the United States had made a decision to go into these places, we took on these responsibilities, and now we're outsourcing that to this private company called Blackwater. And Blackwater is making billions of dollars carrying out government roles with no accountability other than to the people that they're directly working with. We, we, we back here in the country, we don't know what Blackwater is doing. We don't know who those people are. We don't know what kind of control is held over them. What kind of legal responsibilities do they have? When they, for example, in the military, if, if you violate the rules of war in the military or you do various commit criminal acts, you can be prosecuted on the Uniform Code of Military Justice. What about these employees? They're not in the military. They're, they're private sector employees. And there was a situation, for example, in Baghdad uh, in around 2001 or 2002, a bunch of Blackwater employees dressed in uniforms, which means that the civilian population cannot distinguish who are actually American soldiers and who are these mercenaries who are working on behalf uh, of the American government, they shoot down 20 or more civilians in a square in Iraq, women and children. They're acting on our behalf, but they're, act, they're acting as mercenaries or private sector employees being paid by this Blackwater company who made billions of dollars out of their activities in Afghanistan uh, in, in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, and I think, so, so you know, I'm back to the issue of pluses and minuses and to the issue of the inherent responsibilities of certain segments of the government, there, there's just certain things where they, these activities have to be performed by government employees. They have to be bound by the responsibilities and the laws of government employees and ultimately the constitution. These, these Blackwater employees, they don't have any requirement to uphold the Constitution. They're not government employees. They're not, they're, 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 their responsibility is to their company and to make money for the company. Now, who are these people? 
A lot of them were former military. They're former intelligence people. They, they, they do what former Vice President Cheney called, they operate on the dark side, which means they're undercover and so on. But they're acting on our behalf. They're acting on behalf of the citizens of the United States and the American government of the United States and being paid by taxpayers' money to do the things that they're doing, but they don't have the accountability, either legally or morally, in my judgment. And I think this is an instance where consulting and the use of consultants and the use of private contractors has gotten out of hand, gone overboard in, into areas where they ought not to have gone. And again, back to my first example, it's a very far cry from hiring some outfit to do some publications when you get into fighting war and, and so on. So I'll stop there. I'll come back. I want to talk to you about the guy who, had, who started Blackwater, who's going to be my hero or anti-hero, hero, if you will, in this sector. Thank you. Thank you for your speech, Professor Finkenauer. And right now, I'm glad, glad to give the floor to our next speaker, Eduardo Almeida. Please, you're welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is such um, a passionate topic to talk about, business uh, consultancy and security. So I was considering uh, starting by um, giving some, um, some background about business consultant. Uh, I think Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned in the beginning the case of Arthur Delito. So, which is also a remarkable story. Uh, and basically, uh, if you consider business consulting as is today, it comes from the traditional scientific management school, uh, which was basically defined by uh, Frederick Taylor uh, in the late of the 19th and, and early 20th century, right? So uh, we were seeing a momentum of uh, industrialization. Uh, and it is important to notice as well that business consultancy as well as scientific management or consultancy um, has um, its best momentum during crisis. Uh, Miss, Mr. James mentioned um, the case of Blackwater in Iraq. Uh, it is a kind of consultants for sure, uh, but we not only depend on that. So if you see what happened during the Great Depression in the US, uh, the New Deal, the Second World War, the First War, all those companies, they really prospered a lot during these uncertainties, momentous. Uh, if you realize how much companies like uh, Booz Allen, McKinsey grew after the Second World War, it's very impressive. So the US government was really hiring um, specialized companies, uh, 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 thought leadership in, in specialized companies uh, to support uh, citizens and support military and government to uh, evolve after this uh, big crisis, opening opportunities to, to, to uh, citizens and, uh, and, and applying uh, thought leadership and knowledge to transform the society. This is the basis of, of consultative services. Now, when it comes to the business side of the house, we also see a lot of opportunities for companies like this during the times of prosperity. Uh, what happened uh, after the New Deal, for instance, was a great momentum for, uh, for consulting companies. Um, you know, the, 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 the opportunity that was, um, that was activated by um, uh, pre uh, President Roosevelt uh, when he really broke the monopoly of different types of sectors open up a uh, tremendous opportunity for, for companies to apply their knowledge and support this spin-off uh, growing their business. We also see uh, these companies very acti active applying uh, thought leadership and applying best practices in different sectors like hiring, for instance. So whenever a, you know, a company in expansion mode needs to find a certain uh, professional type, a type of professional or, or uh, executive left, they will rely their search on consulting in a different way uh, to attract and retain talents. Now, we also see in the security space a big opportunity for security companies, and they are working very hard on it. Uh, the European legislation for data protection um, requires a lot of standardization and a lot of regulations uh, to, uh, by companies uh, in different sectors. 
So same applies in different countries, like the country that I am now has a similar regulation as Europe in terms of security. And when it comes to security, basically you have two different trends. One is the uh, technical requirements that one has to have uh, in order to be compliant, in order to be protected uh, against additional threats. And the other one is definitely in terms of process. How, what, what do I have to do in terms of process improvement in order to have the best to protect my assets against uh, criminals? Uh, we also have to consider that no one is good in everything. So consulting companies bring this, this knowledge, brings this expertise. So if I am a car manufacturer, a retailer, a broker, whatever, and I have to be compliant with, um, about uh, data regulation, uh, secret data regulation, I will have to rely on someone else to bring me the best practices that I have to implement in my company in order to be compliant. So as society evolves um, and, and threats also evolve and opportunities for growth evolve, companies rely on, secure, on, on, on consulting companies to bring the expertise they need to implement the change they have to implement in their companies in order to be effective, more competitive, and protect against uh, crimes uh, like cyber threats, for instance. Um, Irina, this is, this is uh, my, my, my thought for today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your speech. And right now, let's switch to our second discussion issue. So business heroes of different times. This is the point, this is the issue. And right now, let me please give the floor to Elizabeth Haas Edersheim. You're welcome, Professor. Thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to be with you today and be with such a distinguished panel. Um, let me define again what a business hero is to me. A business hero is someone that changes our expectations about what business can do in a way that's good and healthy for humanity. Um, and it, it could be anything from Andrew Carnegie, who changed what steel could be, to Thomas Hussey, who changed how we bought our shoes. Um, and um, it, it, and it's, it, it, it's very global. My examples will be more uh, centered on North America because I know them better. Um, but, but I've seen it every place in the world. Um, so, and again, against time, I'll start with uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, who you know came to this country, I think, from Scotland, with no money, and 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 died the richest man in the world. Um, but he didn't he didn't create the steel mill to do that. He saw opportunities to put things together in ways other people didn't didn't, and he also believed in unions. Um, and as an early pioneer in the business world, um, he got people he believed that were better than him to work for him, uh, which was, again, very, very counter to the way management was done. It was, it, he was much more humanistic in how he approached things than anyone at the time. Um, my next hero was probably George Eastman. Um, who failed so many times on so many inventions, um, but never adhered to any constraint. Um, so I think it was in uh, 1894, uh, he hired a woman to be his chief engineer, which was unheard of, um, and uh, made the difference in our being able to get that little camera uh, that so many of us have used over time. Uh, Henry Ford changed our sense of what could be delivered to everyone. Um, then you get Thomas Watson, who um, I think was probably the first business person in America who was dreaming not of the next generation, but of the generations after that, as he was working. Um, he wasn't just a great, great salesman. Uh, it, this is the guy that founded IBM. Uh, and you know, let it till six months before he died. Um, but uh, in 1926, he said in a speech, quote, this business of ours has a future. It has a past which we're proud of, but it has a future that will go beyond your lifetime and mine. It has a future for your sons and grandsons and great grandsons. 
because it is an institution, not just an organization of the men that are here. Uh, it changed people's sense of what an organization's responsibilities were. Hence, he was a hero of mine. Uh, some people could say Sam Walton was, I'm gonna pass on that for the moment, even though he was an innovator. Um, Robert Noyce, who co-founded Intel uh, and really began what was is today the Silicon Valley. Um, he, he too, he came from another firm, but he and his partner um, Moore didn't break laws. They didn't adhere to laws, they made laws. Or as Peter Drucker said, you know, the best way to invent, to, to predict is to create. He created laws about how many, how, how much uh, data you could get on a chip and how fast it would grow. And then people adhered to it. I mean, he created a concept that um, can, continues to, to uh, be about breakthroughs. Um, my next hero is Frances Hasselbein. I don't know if you know Frances, but I saw her on Sunday. She's 105 years old, uh, last Sunday, not this Sunday. Uh, and in, uh, in the 80s, basically turned the Girl Scouts of America around. This was an organization that was declining fast and had old principles. And she basically said, came in at the age of 65, never having run anything as, you know, as CEO and said, well, the first thing we have to do is every girl has to be able to see herself here. Can they do that? Nope. How come? Let's make it so every, you know, and then let's, the leaders need to feel important. We're gonna get them trained at Harvard. They need to feel like they matter. Um, we need to have the right badges. It needs to be about the future, not about the past. And an organization that had been declining for eight years was turned around. She was the first woman on the cover of Business Week. Um, and um, Richard Kavanaugh of Harvard would say that wasn't what was important. What was important was she was the first nonprofit leader that Business Week put on the cover, and it changed how people thought about nonprofits that one could be talented and go into the nonprofit world. But she she did all of that, and her most recent book is called um, "Work Is Love Made Visible," and that very much describes her sense of um, what we do, and uh, so many people have followed her. Um, more recently, some of my heroes that have changed things were Paul Pullman, who uh, led Unilever. Uh, and at his first week on the job, he went to the board and said, we're not gonna do quarterly financial reporting anymore. And when asked why he did that the first week, he said, if I had waited two, they would have fired me. Um, but he changed the norm about what they were doing and why they were doing things. He brought in a whole different sense of sustainability and the future. Um, Hubert Jolie, who ran, ran Best Buy, um, did that as well very recently, where he said, um, price is the table stakes. You bring in a price from Amazon, we'll match it. What we need to do is empower our employees so they can service. He created the geek squad that went to your home. And, and one of his favorite stories to tell is about the employee who saw a boy who was four crying because he lost his dinosaur, get on the floor and start helping him find it because he was making his, his customer happy, not because he was selling. That's what Best Buy became. Um, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, you know, there, there are plenty, plenty more, um, but, Heroes are people that really, for me, really business is a vehicle, but not their purpose. Their vehicle is to serve and to make the world a better place. And they do it in a way that changes our expectations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for your speech. And right away, let me please give the floor to Dr. Oleg Maltsev. You're welcome. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. 
Я построил свой доклад таким способом, чтобы он был не только полезен нам с вами как экспертам, но и для того, чтобы он был полезен на аудитории, которая нас сейчас смотрит. I have structured my uh, response to the next question in a way that it is not only beneficial for us experts, but for uh, also for our audience. И в книге, которую я вам показывал, я посвятил целую главу э, героизму бизнесменов. I have dedicated an entire chapter in the book, uh, the cover of which I have demonstrated, uh, dedicated to the heroism of businessmen. В борьбе за денежные знаки. In their fight uh, of chasing the money. Да. Но я э, хотел бы подойти к докладу литературно. However, I would like to approach my um, speech in a uh, literature manner. То есть, по сути своей, я собрал вам литературных героев в хронологическом порядке. I have gathered uh, characters from the literature who are the heroes, heroes in a chronological way. Которые как бы отражали те или, тех или иных э, эталонов, э, бизнесменов той или иной эпохи. Those characters represent, they manifest certain reference figures of a businessman in that or this epoch. И если вы прочитаете подряд эти книги, как бы, то вы получите, так сказать, полное представление о том, в какие времена, какие люди являлись героями для большинства людей. Ну, для человечества в тот или иной момент времени. And if the list of books which I'm going to share in a bit is going to be read by people in a specific chronological order, then one will have a full idea of what was the image of a hero in a specific era in our time. И первый парень, который мне пришел в голову, это Робин Гуд. And the first character that came to my mind is a Robin Hood. Вы скажете, что это не бизнес-герой, а борец за свободу. And uh, you might say that he's not a business hero, but he's somebody who fights for the freedom. Uh, да, наверное, как бы только этот борец за свободу, вместо того, чтобы расчищать лес и заниматься земледелием, грабил всех людей, проходящих через этот лес, не напрягаясь. Probably yes, however, this uh, fighter for the freedom, instead of Cleaning up the forest, he was robbing people who were wandering through the forest. Заняться чем-нибудь другим ему не приходило в голову. Because uh, he didn't think about occupying himself with something else. Такая специфическая аренда леса и аренда, uh, знаете, сервитутов, прохода через этот лес. It was a specific rent of the forest and specific rent of the paths which uh, were in that forest. И он дал очень плохой пример всем нашим последующим бизнесменам. And he set a very bad example to all businessmen that would come after him. Номер два. Потом наступили времена графов Монте-Кристо. Number two. Uh, then we had an era of Graf Monte Cristo. Да. Как вы помните, потрясающий роман Дюма. As you remember, a magnificent novel by, by Alexander Dumas который впоследствии стал прототипом для многих других произведений. Which later on became a prototype for many, many other works. К ему на смену пришел Оноре де Бальзак. After that he was uh, followed by Оноре де Бальзак. Со своим, uh, за каждым большим состоянием стоит преступление. With his uh, monumental quote that says, behind every huge wealth there is a crime. Потом у Генри, который написал о веселых мошенниках и обмане, как бы, да? Number four is uh, Henry, Henry, who wrote about um, different uh, funny stories about delinquents and the way people made money through the deception. Потом наступили времена героев Стивенсона. After that, we had times uh, when We saw the heroes of the Stevenson. Времена острова сокровищ. Uh, these were times of the Treasury Island. Да, и uh, после этого мы, мы видим Конан Дойля, да? After that, number six is Conan Doyle's book. Как его, uh, так сказать, герои от сокровищ Агры к индустриализации зарабатывают себе на жизнь 
тяжким трудом. We saw how his characters, his heroes, would uh, fight really hard to make the wealth, starting from the treasure of Agra till industrialization. Особенно мне понравилась собака Баскервили. Particularly, um, I was uh, I really like his work, uh, which uh, Baskerville's dog. Да, если вы помните, там Шерлок Холмс задает вопрос, а сколько стоит все состояние? If you remember in that work, there is a scene when Sherlock Holmes asked, uh, what is the cost of this entire fortune? И ему его друг отвечает, миллион. And his friend replies him, one million. Он берется за голову и говорит, да за такие деньги любой может пуститься в сомнительное предприятие. And he, and Sherlock Holmes replies him, well, for this sum of money, anybody would take any uh, suspicious endeavor. После этого мы, мы встречаем Теодора Драйзера. After that, uh, it is about the era of Theodore Dreiser, который всех влюбил в финансовую отрасль. Who uh, allured everybody into the finances industry. Потом мы встречаем Джека Лондона. After that, he is followed by Jack London. С его золотой лихорадкой with his um, golden um, rush. И наконец мы подходим к главному бизнес произведению Америки и всего мира Марио Пьюзо крёстный отец. And here we come to the main work um, when it comes to business of the US and other parts of the world, Mario Puzo's work Godfather. Ну и, конечно, на самой вершине стоит Робинс Горальд, как бы со своим парк авеню, как бы, который, по сути, всю формулу бизнеса Соединенных Штатов Америки изложил в своих произведениях секс, деньги и власть. And uh, lastly, it's Robins Geralt's uh, work, Avenue Park, uh, the, in the book uh, Sex, Money and Power, he demonstrated entire formula of American business. Да, и по сути своей очень многие люди могут сказать, Олег Викторович, у тебя очень, очень такое злостное представление о бизнесменах. Most of the people might say that, Dr. Matov, you have very evil perspective on businessmen. Но это не мое представление о бизнесменах, а представление мировой литературы. But I should point out that this is not my perspective about businessmen, this is the view of uh, global literature on them. Я не писал этих книг. As I didn't author those books. И уж тем более не жил те времена. And didn't live in those eras. Да. А я думаю, что писатели очень точно отобразили облик бизнесмена во всех тех периодах, которые я описал. Спасибо за внимание. And I do think that authors did a magnificent job to precisely describe the image of businessmen in this or that period. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you so much for your speech, Dr. Maltsev. And right away, let me please give the floor to Professor James Finkenauer. You're welcome. Please turn on your mic. Get the mic on. Well, that's a tough act to follow, Dr. Maltsev. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go from all of those well-known characters and heroes to what is going to appear now to be a very mundane single guy. <laughs> so, so we're going to go from here down to, to here, and there's a very tiny level. Anyway, my guy is Eric Prince. And whether, whether you consider Eric Prince to be a hero or what I would call an anti-hero depends in part, a uh, large part, on your political perspective and depends upon what your views are about war and the military. If you, if you come from the premise of being an anti-war peace person uh, and, and uh, uh, let's say a more liberal progressive side of the political spectrum, Eric Prince is probably not gonna be your guy. Uh, on the other hand, if you, if you see war and, and you know, as, a, as a necessary instrument of foreign policy, et cetera, and you see a strong role for the military and you have that sort of inclination, then Eric Prince may well be your guy. So, so as I said, he's either a hero or anti-hero, depending upon the perspective that you want to take. 
what I think is undeniable about him is he has what I would call a warrior mentality. He himself, Eric Prince, attended the United States Naval Academy, although he didn't graduate from there. Uh, and when I was thinking, when I was preparing for this and I'm reading about Eric Prince's background, one of the thoughts I had is that one of the reasons why Eric Prince didn't, didn't stay at the Naval Academy and graduate from there is that he didn't want to follow all the rules and all the structure. He wanted to be more independent and free thinking than was possible if you were a, a midshipman at the, at the Naval Academy. He did, however, subsequently, he then, he then transferred, he graduated from college. He became a Navy SEAL. And if you know anything about the Navy SEALs, these are a, the special forces operation of the Navy. These are the people, men and women, who take on the most dangerous, risky tasks that the Navy uh, uh, engages in. These are the warriors, if you will. They're the front people. They're the, they're the people out front there taking, on the, taking the risk and taking on the dangerous tasks, which means that they're either unafraid of danger and, and, and unafraid and they're not fearful, or they're able to control their fear and they're able to marshal it in such a way that they, that they, that they have the courage to overcome their own fears to, to, to take on the activities that they take on. They, they would, if I were gonna apply a label to them, whether they be men or women, I would call them macho. These are, these are very masculine warrior types, including whether they're women or not, they're masculine warrior, warrior types. So what did, what did Eric Prince do? He actually built several companies. He built this Blackwater that I, that I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and these companies were very financially successful. Uh, he engaged in training, programs for the military operations and so on. Uh, I mean, we're talking about multi-million dollar, billion dollar businesses that, that this guy was able uh, to build. And, and, and to, go, to go back to think about this warrior mentality, and this, by the way, is a question I would throw out to my colleagues here, who I think all of you know more about business and economics than I do, but I would throw this out on the table as a, as a hypothesis. It seems to me that this, this notion of the warrior mentality and being risk averse and a, having a kind of can-do attitude would also translate over to success in the business world. In order to be a successful entrepreneur, you gotta be a risk taker. You gotta, you gotta have some sense of, of uh, not being overly fearful and overly cautious and overly careful uh, that you're unwilling to take that on. Some of you, and I recall this, this movie where the guy, his name was uh, Gek, Gordon Gecko. Some of you may remember this movie, Gordon Gecko, played by Michael Douglas. That kind of person, this kind of person who has, who's tough, who's macho, who tolerates no nonsense, and who, whose bottom line that has that focus. But this is similar, I think, at least in my mind, and again, I throw this on the table, to having this kind of warrior uh, mentality. Building a successful company, I think, requires that. Uh, but there's also, to a degree, uh, and there's also, and this is something I used to talk to my students about, uh, you know, over many years, uh, having to do with risk-taking. There are risks, and then there are risks. When do you know that, that a risk-taking is a prudent risk-taking as opposed to something that's foolish? Something that on its face is going to like take you to a place where you don't want to go, and don't you see what the where you're going off the edge here, and what it is that you're proposing to do? Now, where is that line drawn? Who knows? And different people see it uh, in different places. But the, but again, this notion of, of risk taking and linked to the idea of, of uh, warrior mentality. It helps, by the way, that Eric Prince came from a wealthy family background. That means he had the capital resources when he was starting out in business. He, he didn't start from nothing. He came with a, you know, with a capital base that he could invest to, 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 to build these businesses. He's also very politically connected. It was his sister, Betsy DeVos, who was the Secretary of Education in the Trump administration. So he's well connected in terms of Republican political uh, circles. He, 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 and this obviously political connections if you're, if you're doing uh, consulting of the kind that I described earlier, are, are, are important. In fact, they're, they're crucial. You don't get contracts. You don't get on the inside unless somebody knows you, somebody recommends you, and you've got some kind of 
uh, uh, connections. Eric Prince had that. He had those sort of connections uh, and he was able to, to, to build on that. And, and, and he's still active. I'm reading in the, in the New York Times two days ago, there's a pro there was a project called Project Veritas, which was, which was intended to go after people who were detracting President Trump. Uh, and who's, who's organizing these people and bringing them together? Eric Prince. Uh, so he's the same guy, started with Blackwater back in the 90s, still active politically, still able, and, but, but employing that same sort of strategy, that same sort of approach that he seemed to have had from the beginning. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there, but what I, would, what I would hope, if we have some time, I'd like to throw that question out on the table about this warrior mentality and his connection with entrepreneurship and, and hear what my colleagues here think about that, that notion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Finkinawa. Thank you so much. And let me please give the floor to our next speaker, Eduardo Almeida, please, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so great topic. I, I, I really enjoy it, James, your passion and enthusiasm about this because it's truly a great, great team. So um, let's start by making some assumptions. So I think that uh, business heroes, uh, they have some, a few qualities in common. So I have, I have took some notes here while you were talking. So I, I think that they all have a strong leadership. So they, they really, they are really re leaders, through leaders. Uh, they have a strong sense of purpose. So, uh, and I just, you know, it comes to my mind now, uh, Walt Disney. So he changed the way people entertain forever, right? Forever. Uh, they also are uh, relentless. So if we recall Thomas Edison here, this man, he had more than 1,100, 1,100 patents. But this is not the merit. So the merit is how many times he failed in order to have 1,100 patents and how persistent he was to get, to get it done and to really believe in it was possible. I also think that curiosity is, is really an ingredient, ingredient for success in the business. So uh, a guy like, uh, like Musk, Elon Musk, he is really curious. You know, he is relentless in this sense. He probably is more curious uh, than, than, you know, uh, than anyone else in this list because he, he's never, he's, he now talks about moving or going to, to, the, to, to Mars. Now with the, the, the earth is not enough. So uh, we have to go above and beyond boundaries. Uh, to, um, to get things done. I think also another point uh, of interest is the vision. So those men, they are ahead of their time. They understand how they can change the way people live, learn, work, play by inventing new things. So they are ahead of their time. They really anticipate trends and they productize something could be a dream, could be a product, could be whatever, but they make it possible, which is, which is really, really amazing. And just to summarize my point, uh, the most important thing is the legacy. So what is it left behind when they go? Uh, what do they leave to the society? How did they change society? What, are, what was the impact of their creations, inventions to the society? Um, we talked about companies that are, you know, was there, are there forever, right? Um, I think Professor Elizabeth mentioned uh, Andrew Carnegie or John Rockefeller, uh, you know, they, their companies are there, you know, uh, forever. They employ people, they improve wealth, uh, wellness, they create value uh, to companies and to society. And, and this is, this is what, what's important, right? So uh, companies that are driven by, by values, they have impact, they impact the society in different ways and they leave a beautiful legacy to the future generations. So thank you very much, uh, Irina, and back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear experts, dear speakers for sharing your perspectives, for sharing your viewpoints. Again, let me thank everyone, all the organizers and participants. Overall, it's high time we have finished the online panel of 
our second online panel of the International Conference Real Life and Real Economics, arranged by the European Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. So soon after the conference issues, such as text papers, video reports, online discussions panels will be published on the conference website later on. But the more conference collection volume will be published as well, and that brochure will be available to those who are interested. But this again, thank you so much for your kind attention. See you soon, see you tomorrow, see you on the third panel of this wonderful international conference, Real Life and Real economics. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.